Hi, welcome to this uh, webinar. Our part three of masterclass in SolidCam uh, simultaneous five axis milling. We will start in approximately three minutes from now. We will wait for more people to join in. Thank you very much for your patience. Hi, thank you for waiting. So today is the uh, final session of our masterclass, the part three of uh, solid cam simultaneous five axis milling. Uh, as uh, usual in our past two uh, segments, we will we have our agenda where we will again look at the five axis offering of what we are giving with solid cam. We will also see the demonstration on uh, parts on the uh, items that we are going to, uh, or the modules that we are going to explain and see. And then finally, today we are going to have the summary of the entire three sessions. So uh, looking at our offerings that we have, if we want to brush up again, we have the generic four and five axis milling, which we have already seen. Today, we are going to see multi-axis machining, multi-blade machining, port machining, rotary machining, edge breaking, edge trimming, and auto three plus two roughing. So uh, rather auto three plus two roughing we have already seen. So from item number two to item number seven is what we are going to see. Uh, the best part of all of these processes is that they are highly automated processes, which means uh, not much of a user input is needed when uh, you are working with these processes. For example, if you're working with an multi-blade machining for impellers, then you don't need to define all those uh, construction geometries. You don't need to uh, define how your tool is going to be tilted, nothing like that. It, it more or less mimics simple three-axis operations, most of these processes. Right, so let's uh, go ahead and uh, look at the first one today which is the multi-axis machining. Multi-axis machining basically has got few components in it, but we are going to see the uh, the only one component today, and that is multi-axis roughing. Basically, this operation creates a multi-axis tool path that can be used to rough out and also finish pocket shape shape geometries in full five axis. The user, like I said, with most of our application-based strategies, the definition is very less. So the user specifies the wall, the floor, and the ceiling surfaces, and the system computes the toolpath automatically, creating either roughing or finishing toolpath the way uh, what you have defined. 
We also have a facility where we're going to see the adaptive roughing. Uh, and uh, with the newer generation strategies that we are integrating inside multi-axis machining, we also have wall and floor finishing utilizing the new generation barrel tools or circle end mills. So let's go ahead straight away and start look at uh, start looking at the uh, paths that we have with the multi-axis machining. So I'm going to open a part. By the way, the multi-axis machining uh, has got a couple of uh, uh, other applications, and we are going to see one of our very interesting applications that we have uh, with multi-axis machining. So here we have a part. Uh, the moment you see this part, a lot of you might get some idea of why these pockets are made. Mostly these pockets are made only to reduce the weight of the component. And uh, this is done mostly in the aerospace segment. And I would like to rough out these uh, pockets. Now, one way of doing this roughing is to create a few three plus two toolpaths and then use the uh, swarf uh, to finish the pocket. Now, instead of creating uh, a few three plus two tool paths, how about creating one tool path which will handle the part in complete uh, full 5x? So let me change the machine first, just in case we would like to see the uh, simulation. Um, so I'm going to use the I-500. Continue. Okay. So the first one is this orange colored pocket we are going to look at. And like I explained, we have two styles of cutting. One is the contour style, which is a typical three axis roughing style, which uh, many of you will, uh, will immediately associate it with. It's basically a contour kind of roughing style. And the other one is the eye machining style or the adaptive style, which, which you are looking at these days in many of the uh, roughing uh, systems. So in the contour roughing style, if I open the tool path, so it's a roughing tool path. And in the roughing tool paths, I have to define, first of all, my machining surfaces. Okay, so if I select the machining surfaces, you can see that I have only selected the pocket that I need to cut, not, not everything. And then I have got the floor surfaces. So if I click on show, I can see that my floor surfaces is also defined, it's a single floor. I don't need to do anything else. The machining surface and the floor surface, the system all automatically identifies the area that needs to be roughed out. It, it figures out what is going to be my floor and what is, what is going to be my ceiling from the entire uh, machining surface that was uh, selected. And I'm gonna leave 0.5 millimeter stock on my uh, wall, basically. And on the floor, I'm going to leave about one millimeter. The tool I'm going to use here is a 16 uh, bull nose with a corner radius two millimeters. And you can see that most of the areas are having very, very less parameters. For example, retracts, it's just the safety and the uh, entry and the exit safety distance. Constraint boundaries, if you want, you can provide constraint boundaries. I'm not using constraint boundaries here. Instead, I go into the geometry and I have defined what we call as a local area stock. Now, what is a local area stock? A local area stock basically encompasses the volume of this particular region. So I select all these surfaces and I've also created another surface on top of this just to close it and that surface. So that creates a volume for machining for solid cam. We can create what we call as a local surface, local stock. You don't need to depend on the main stock. You can just say, I have a local stock and use this local stock for machining. So these are the surfaces that I have selected, including the one on the top, which you are not seeing here because I've hidden that. Including that, it creates a volume. So this volume I'm going to use here for my machining. Uh, well, more or less, this is it. And then I need to define whether I'm going to use ramp, how the ramps are going to happen between slices, between regions. If there are two or three regions, then how the ramping is going to happen. Basically, that's, that's it. Once this is done, I'm going to save this. 
and we'll just calculate this toolpath. The calculation is more or less pretty quick, considering the fact that it is actually doing a five axis calculation. Okay, so we have the toolpath here. So you can see that it more or less resembles a normal three axis uh, contour style toolpath or pocketing style toolpath. And if I run into the simulation, and if I take it into the machine simulation here, Uh, of course, yes, because it's a small machine, let it run. Uh, somebody just asked me a question on why I have to create an additional surface here for my uh, stock and not use the 3D model for the stock. A uh, couple of reasons. Okay, this machine is too small, but let's, let's ignore it for a moment. Uh, and let's look at how it's going to run the simulation. So it's it's a pure uh, 5x kind of a simulation. Okay, so it's doing almost like doing it in simultaneous, but we can always change the machine. So I'm going to change the machine very quickly. And by when I'm changing the machine, I'm going to answer this question. So uh, I was asked why uh, why are we using uh, local stock and why not the updated stock? If I use an updated stock. In this case, uh, the uh, the single uh, issue that I might encounter is that for the first pocket, it's per it's perfectly fine. For the second, third, fourth pocket, as my pockets start increasing, it has to calculate the updated stock every time. Instead of that, I'm saying don't 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 do any kind of calculation. I'm telling you where my stock is. So solid cam gives me both the possibilities. So if I go to my stock here, I have both the possibilities here. I can use an auto updated stock, or I can just say, use these surfaces as my stock. We go even a step ahead. It's, if it's a simple kind of a geometry, I can simply use a 2D boundary as a stock. Okay, so even that can be considered as a stock. A 2D boundary can be considered as a stock. But in this case, I'm using group of surfaces as my stock. Okay, so let's again simulate this process. Go to the machine simulation. Okay, and this is how the machining will look like. Right, now let's go ahead and look at another pocket here. We have a, we have a pocket on this side also that we need to see. Again, here I've done the same thing. I'm not using the previous updated stock, only for the fact that I want a faster calculation and I don't want to depend on the previous stock for my this, this pocket. So here I've got another style of machining in uh, five axis. And here I'm using a, a option called as adaptive. Earlier we used the offset, uh, offset kind of a strategy, which is basically the uh, regular pocketing kind of a strategy in three axis and now we are using the adaptive strategy again it's the same if i look at the machining surfaces everything else is the machining surface i've defined and then i have the floor surface sorry not new this is the floor surface that i've picked pretty simple just pick the machining surface and the floor uh, solid cam will identify what is the floor and what is the wall in this case 
The tool in this case remains the same. Uh, there are no constraint boundaries. If I go back again here into the stock, I have got the local stock that I've defined. I'm not using the updated uh, geometry here or updated stock in this case. Uh, basically, I have to define what is my maximum step over and what is my desired step over in this case. What is the max and what, what I desire to maintain. And uh, I can also specify if I'm doing climb and conventional, that is zigzag machining, what should be the step over in when it's doing climb machining and what should be the step over when it's doing the conventional machining. So it changes the step over because we know that when we are doing climb machining on, on the new generation machines, the cutting is much more efficient without any much noise or anything. But when we are doing the uh, up milling or the conventional milling when we do, we tend to get a lot of vibrations. In such cases, you can have a lesser step over when we are doing conventional cutting and a bigger step over when you're doing the climb cutting. So I'm going at 100% of the step over when I'm doing climb and 80% when I'm doing conventional. And then we have the clearance. That means when it retracts back to the, uh, to the next pass, it will clear the floor surface by 0.5 millimeter, okay? Whatever value you can say, this is the clearance value. And I can say I can define whether I want my number of slices or I would like to have by distance or depth of cut. Since I'm using the adaptive style, it makes sense to have a number of slices. So one, and uh, this is it. So I'm just saved it and let's calculate this part. <clears throat> Okay, so that's done and you can see the style of cutting. Uh, it's the adaptive style where it tries to maintain a constant uh, uh, engagement into the part. So this entire thing is done using uh, the uh, simultaneous five axis. So the movements are simultaneous five axis. Okay, so it's not that uh, it's, uh, three axis movements or three plus two movements. They're full full five axis movements. So if we generate an output for this, for example, let's generate a G code. Again, the best part of this is uh, the fact that we have got uh, Simco integrated into it. So my tool path will be opened with Simco and you can look at the uh, passes. We are generating uh, the uh, angles using three vectors a3 b3 and c3 which is basically vectors around, along x vector along y and vector along z which basically translates into the uh, a and c angle or b and c angle depending on the machine construction so i can go into the my black into my back plot let me check if i've got a dmg here 65 monoblock and uh, i think this was siemens so i'm going to use siemens 840d here Okay, and let's run the back plot. So here we have the toolpath. Okay, so you can even back plot the toolpath back into the actual part inside uh, Simco. Right, so uh, we have seen straightforward roughing operations. Now, since 2021, uh, we introduced another very nice function inside multi-axis machining, and that is to handle what we call as the undercuts. Uh, undercuts, because assume, because the tool is always going to go normal to the uh, floor. When the tool goes normal to the floor, if this particular wall has got an undercut looking normal to the floor, then it will leave material here, okay? Because it won't cut that. Since 2021, we have now introduced another feature inside multi-axis machining. Now to see that, I'm going to open another uh, part. Let's open a structural component. <clears throat> okay. 
So I have a, a part here, and uh, if I just edit this uh, part, I'm into my uh, CAD environment, and I would now like to do a draft angle analysis using the this plane as my pulling plane or pull direction. And you can see that there are many areas that are having negative draft, okay? Obviously, on one side, there's positive, the other side will be negative. So the red areas are all negative drafts when looking normal to my floor. So multi-axis machining gives me a possibility to only tackle and remove the the amount of material remaining in this region. For example, let's say I have done a three-axis roughing, okay? So when I do three-axis roughing, I know that here in this region, I'm going to have material straight uh, like a wall remaining here. And I would like to remove only that area, okay? Multi-axis uh, machining gives you a possibility to do exactly that. So I have a toolpath here. So let me edit this toolpath and I'll show you what it, what exactly I mean. Uh, again, in this geometry, I have got the machining surface. Now the best part in machining surface is that you can use machining surface as individual surfaces or you could just define it as one single solid, okay? So it's not necessary that you need to define only surfaces. You can also define it as, uh, into as a as a solid model itself so if you look at my target this entire thing is my target okay perfect and then i have got my floor surfaces so i've picked all these surfaces as my floor surfaces nothing new here what is new is into my toolpath parameters if i go into my uh, sorting we have got a function called as undercut machining. Now in undercut machining, I have got three options. One is I can ignore or leave the undercuts. Don't machine them at all. Or machine undercuts along with the other area, okay? So it's you can simply do a three axis kind of a roughing and in the undercut area, it will do five axis machining. Or I can say, just machine only the undercut area or where the material has been left out because of the geometry that has created an undercut. So I'm going to use this option called as machine only, and I'm going to extend the undercuts by five millimeters into the regions where there are no undercuts, just to have a overlap kind of a situation. So I'll save this. And I'll just calculate. By the way, it doesn't know anything where the uh, material is remaining. It only can analyze the geometry based on the undercuts. What you can see here is toolpaths that have been created only in those regions. So if I again uh, go into the edit and if I go into evaluate draft angle analysis with even this, you can see all those red areas, it has created toolpath, except the outer one, because there is no longer any uh, area there to uh, cut. I have asked it to machine only within the ambit of the part, okay, not the outside of the part. So wherever we have the uh, undercut, it has created the toolpath, okay? So it's pretty amazing in the way it uh, handles the toolpath. So I'm going to run the simulation. Let's do a machine simulation. You will notice that the outer pass, the first pass will be almost like a three axis motion. And once it goes into or goes close to the wall, it creates a five axis motion. First, three axis, five axis, three axis, five axis, three axis, five axis. So it creates a three axis motion. Now that, that three axis motion is coming because I've asked for an overlap, okay? That five millimeter overlap that I asked, that is the reason for creating a three axis motion. Otherwise it could, it directly will create a five axis motion straight away. And it only handles the regions where the undercut is not, it doesn't go anywhere else where there are no undercuts. A very interesting, uh, uh, option inside multi-axis machining.
right so these are some of our applications of uh, multi access machining let's uh, go back to my presentation uh we have done the part demo of we have shown you two parts today we are now going to jump into uh, multi-blade machining. Multi-blade machining was introduced into, so, into solid cam, I think about three, four years back. And since then it has really grown into its strengths. It's a very powerful engine for machining impellers and blisks, only impellers and blisks. You cannot use multi-blade machining to machine the part that I just showed you, the structural part, no because it is expecting a geometry in a particular way it's expecting uh, the shape of the geometry in a particular way that is the reason it can only handle impellers and blisks and nothing else okay you can have impellers with splitters number of splitters is not limited you can have one splitter two three four five six splitters it's not uh, <clears throat> it is not limited to the amount of splitters that you can have the splitters are the small blade in between the two main blade absolutely minimum inputs are need, needed to generate the tool path okay you don't really need to define uh, the tool axis control how the tool is going to enter what is going to do how it's going to tilt what are the gauge check options nothing very absolutely bare minimum uh, inputs are needed the tool access control is automatically handled by solid cam and root fillets very important there are fillets on the part and at the end you would like to machine only the fillets that also are handled by multi axis multi blade machining and we have strategies for machining for roughing blade finishing fillet finishing and hub finishing so they are uh, very uh, nicely done i mean you don't need to uh, take only one and then play around with it. There are separate strategies for each of them. So let's look at a nice impeller here. <clears throat> Go to open a part. And this is an actual part. It's not a demonstration part or something like that. It's an actual impeller. It's it's not easy also and if you look at the size the diameter approximately is about 251 so we have it's a pretty uh, i would say a medium sized impeller and the height of the uh, impeller is approximately about 117 mm so it's not small either so this particular impeller has got two main blades and it has got a splitter in between we can somehow with our generic generate uh, finishing programs for this that should not that's not a problem the two main issues come up is roughing this impeller and finishing the hub of the impeller that's where most of our energy will go off and we might not be successful at the end when we are using generic although if you are very smart enough and you can create those geometries to uh, handle the tool axis properly, you will be successful in even creating such a tool path in generic. But the amount of effort and the amount of time that would go in generating tool paths for such complex parts is very high. And at the end of the day, it's not worth the effort. You might end up spending a full day just trying to create a proper tool axis for this because it's not an easy part. It's a pretty complex part if you look at in that way so what we have in multi-blade uh, machining so if i open one of the tool paths so we have roughing blade finishing hub finishing and fillet finishing this four strategies will take care of the entire uh, impeller to uh, go with so we have the first roughing and in that we have geometry definition so in the geometry definition, I'll just show you the geometry that was selected. So you can see what was selected here. Two main blades and the splitter, including the bottom fillet. This forms our geometry for roughing of my impeller. And what else? We also have the hub. 
Now, very interesting here is that the hub need not be exactly in the same place where the blades are, because the hub anyway is a revolved section. So one small piece of hub somewhere else in some other portion of the impeller is more than enough for the system to compute the toolpath. So we have the blade, we have the hub. Uh, let's go back into the toolpath. And I'm going to keep about 0 0.9 millimeters for my uh, stock on my blades and approximately 10 millimeters stock on my hub because I want to use that 10 millimeters with another tool. I want to machine the remaining 10 millimeters with another tool. The tool I'm using here is a 10 uh, taper ball nose tool. And uh, let's look at how the tool looks like. Again, this tool is from a Moog. It's a pretty uh, powerful tool, can take a depth of cut of approximately 15 to 18 millimeters at one go and uh, about one millimeter side step on either side. So it's a very uh, nice tool. So I'm going to use this tool for roughing. Uh, levels, you can see that the clearance is set to spear and the dimensions are auto detect. That means I don't need to define anything here. I just say use a spear encompassing the uh, impeller and the dimensions are automatic. In the toolpath parameters, I need to define the tolerance. I need to define the number of layers that I want, either number of layers or the distance, the depth of cut. In this case, I'm using a depth of cut of uh, 10 millimeters. And like I said, the tool can easily take about 15 to 18 millimeters of depth of cut, but we have gone a bit safe and we have used 10 millimeter depth of cut here. The side step is set to only 0.8 because the corner radius is, I think, R2. So we can't exceed one millimeter. We have to be within one millimeter. So I've taken 0 0.8 as my step over. And I have also said that the 10 millimeter depth of cut, because it is going to create in one go 10 millimeters, I don't like that. So I'm going to take 2.5 millimeter depth of cut first to create a channel, to allow the tool to create a channel. And once the tool has created the channel all the way down to 10 millimeters, then it will open up using the side step. Okay, so this is to just to create the channel. 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. So you're going to see four cuts first creating a channel. And after the channel has been created, it will open up using the side step. And in the sorting, I just need to define what is the method. I'm going to use zigzag and I'll start from the leading edge. The leading edge is nothing but this side. It will start the uh, approach to the impeller from this part of the uh, uh, impeller. And we are using the ordering from center away climb. That means the first cut in both the cases will be at the center of this profile. So when it's doing this area, it will start at the center of this and then expand and touch this blade and this part of the splitter. When it is doing here, it will again start exactly at the center of these two profiles and then go and touch this blade and this blade. And that's how it's going to machine the uh, part. Tool axis, you can see there's nothing in this case. There are some values and most of these values are defaults and their defaults, they work very well. Okay, so unless you want to define a limit to the machine, because you're seeing that it is going beyond a certain limit, you would like to limit it you can use the machine angle limit. Otherwise, it's good enough or good to go. Uh, link, I have only opened up. In, in most of the cases, it is automatic, but there were some retracts, so I'm using a blend splice option. Apart from that, everything else is just set to automatic. If there is a collision, you can specify uh, check surfaces, but in this case, since I've already used group of blades, there won't be any collisions because those collision checks will be done automatically when it is calculating the toolpath. Right, and the only thing next remaining is the rotation. So I have got seven pockets here. So it's going to calculate one and then rotate the toolpath into the other seven pockets. You can specify whether you want to go clockwise, anti-clockwise, you want to machine a specific segment or you just want to machine everything. You want to start at a specific segment and machine everything. So all these variables can be defined. Just save it. No need to make any kind of uh, calc uh, definitions. 
you simply can hit the save and calculate button. Done. So when I said that we are going to take four depth of cuts to create a channel, I was actually meaning here. You can see I've got pass one, pass two, pass three, pass four, and the fifth pass, it is taking the cut on the impeller itself. So it is first creating a channel. Okay, so let's look at the simulation. I'm going to go into solid verify. Okay, so this is my roughed up stock, I have the fixture also. And uh, let's go step by step because I would like to see the channel. Okay, so it's going to be somewhere here. So I'll go step by step. That's one, two, the first one is not going to be much. So you can see that it created a small cut and now it is going to expand that cut using the side step. Just going to go into the next cut because I want to show you the channel. Okay, now you can see that it's creating the channel. Okay, so it creates this channel first. And then it expands this channel to to machine the uh, the blade itself. So this is how it's going to look like. It's going to increase the speed of my simulation. Again, channel, and then open up the pocket. You can see that it's already started to get the uh, splitter, so it creates two channels here. Channel one first, and as it touches the splitter, it will jump on the other side and create another channel and open the other side of the uh, channel. <clears throat> Let's switch off the holder for a moment. Okay, so this is how it's actually going to keep doing the uh, machining uh, of the particular pocket that we are seeing. So it's finished that pocket, now it's going to the next pocket and so on. Uh, what happens to the remaining material that's remaining here? We're going to use a different tool because this tool is pretty short. So I can't use this particular tool to uh, go all the way down, we will have collisions with the uh, with the geometry. So I'm going to use a completely different tool in this case, a 12 diameter tapered ball nose. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to use a 12 diameter tapered ball nose. And uh, I'm going to repeat the same process. The geometry remains the same. Okay, it's the same uh, blade. I'm going to use, again, stock to leave is about 0.9. Uh, stock to leave on the hub is about 0.6. The tool here I'm using is a 12 uh, taper ball nose tool. So this is how the tool is going to look like. Okay, and uh, in this case, I instead of using the depth of cut here, I have said I want 
six passes and the distance between each pass is about 1.8 millimeters. It, this tool can dig at one, one uh, time at a time. It can go five millimeter depth of cut, but we never took it because of the machine constraint. We have just taken about 1.8 millimeters here and the side step here can go up to 3.4 millimeters. So it's pretty good sideways. Again, here I'm using 2.5 to just create a channel. And let's hit the calculate button. This is a real-time calculation. I'm not running any movie here. So this is how the calculation speed looks like. So remaining areas I have done with a shorter, uh, I mean, with a lesser depth of cut, I'm roughing out the regions. So straight away, my roughing is done. You can imagine if I had to do this using the generic, the amount of construction, the amount of struggle that I had to go to machine this, I may have been successful at the end of the day, but the amount of time spent and the energy spent would really not be worth it. So you can see that the automation that has come into solid can can actually reduce this calculation to a couple of seconds, few seconds, rather than running into a few hours or a day completely. Right, so once we have done the uh, roughing, we can either run semi-finishing or we can directly go into finishing. So we have got the blade finishing functionality here. I'm using the same tool, the 12 uh, corner radius two, and I have just selected the main blade. So I don't need to select the entire group here. I just need to select one complete set or not one, one complete blade, including the bottom fillet. That's all that is needed. We then need to select the hub, can be the same, whatever was selected for roughing. And what I've done here is because earlier when I cal calculated, I realized that uh, this particular uh, tool path was actually touching the side of the uh, splitter. So I would like to provide some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, collision check against only these surfaces of the splitter because that's the area where it was causing problems. So I've selected only this area to be checked for collisions. Everything else is already being checked with the blade. And uh, the strategy that I'm using is I'm going parallel to hub. Now, many times people don't like this strategy just because visually it doesn't look nice, but actually the surface quality that comes up is much better otherwise, if we go parallel from the ceiling, from this surface to the bottom surface, if we go morphing between them, the toolpath will look very nice visually. You'll have very good surface quality on this side of the impeller. But when it comes to this part, the toolpaths converge because the step over is taken on the maximum area. And when it comes to the, uh, to the trailing side, the toolpaths are actually converging on this part. So you will see a lot of rubbing action happening on the uh, trailing side, which will generally give away the surface quality. Your surface quality won't look nice, although the toolpath will be visually looking very beautiful. Okay, but even this looks pretty good. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, I'm going to go parallel to the hub. So it's like going parallel to the bottom surface. Uh, the step down here in this case, I've just taken this one millimeter and it's going to encompass the entire blade, including the fillet. So let's hit the calculate button. It's creating 107 passes. So it's doing the calculation now. Again, there's nothing, no tool access control. Everything is completely controlled and automated by SolidCam. done. So this is a single blade because I didn't use the transformation, but you can see how the uh, step over looks like. It's constant even in this region, okay? It's constant there and it's constant also here, okay? Don't worry about the fillets. The fillets will be finished using a completely different strategy called fillet machining. So if you look at the simulation, uh, let's go into the machine simulation. Oh, 
sorry. want to do that. I didn't want to do this, but we have to now accept this. Well, it's better we close the, I'll just kill the process and we can be good to go with the, then this also, okay, nothing to worry. We've not lost anything. <clears throat> Okay, so let's open that file again. <clears throat> so I'll run the simulation and go into the machine simulation. So the machine that I'm using here for this particular part is a Herco VM 10i, 10UI rather, it's a five axis machine. And this was the exact machine on which this part was also cut. Small machine, but very nice. So I have loaded the part along with the fixture on the, on the table. And we have the tool, the holder and everything, and you can run the simulation straight away. Yeah, let's go into the time mode. And don't need we don't need to specify anything. The tool access everything is taken automatically by Solid Cam, and you can see that there are absolutely no retracts. Okay, the tool is just jumping over the uh, the the uh, the ceiling face and going onto the uh, blade straight away. So no retraction, nothing of that sort. It's nicely machining the entire part as it is. Okay, so that was the blade machining. We now can do the same thing, the same application can be done to do the splitter. So if you look at the splitter geometry that was selected, I've just selected <clears throat> one portion of the entire splitter, including the bottom fillet. And then we have the hub. Again, the hub can remain the same, no changes. And because there was a collision that I detected. So small portion of the main blade was also selected as a part of collision check, okay? Because the tool has to check because this area is really very tight for the tool, okay? So I have selected this particular surface as a collision check. That's all that is needed. And let's run the calculation. The strategy here remains the same. It's going to go parallel to the hub. Okay. This is how it's machined the uh, splitter. No need to define any kind of tool access. Only thing is you have to, you have to be very uh, judgmental. I mean, you, you have to judge 
and find out which area of the main blade might cause problems in collision. Just select those surfaces as part of the check surface. Everything else will be taken care by solid cam. Right, so once this is done, we will now handle the fillets of the impeller. Again, for machining the fillet, I all, all I have to do is to select the blade, entire blade, including the fillet, the hub, and of course, if there are any areas that you think might be involved into, in, into some collisions, you can select only those areas here for checking for collisions. That's all, there's nothing else. The only thing uh, different between machining a blade and machining a fillet is the, uh, in the technology, the number of cuts. Because when it's doing a fillet machining, it's going to come from two sides the hub side as well as the blade side. So it needs to know what are you going to apply here when it's coming from the hub side or the blade side, whether you're going to use the number of cuts or big diameter or same as the hub. So I've used two passes from the blade side and five passes from the hub side. Both will converge at the center of the fillet. The side step that I've used is approximately about 0.3 millimeters and in the sorting, it's a spiral tool path. That means one entry and the engagement will be the last one. In between that, it will spiral out the entire passes. Right, so I'm going to save this and we will run the calculation. You can see how the hub or how the fillets is taken care of. So if I run now this simulation in my machine simulation, it's even more interesting. Oops, that's too fast. So that's how it's actually going to machine. Only the fillet. All the tool axis, collision checks, everything taken care of. No issues at all. I'm pretty sure about this because this part was done on the machine straight away. We didn't have to do anything else. That's it. So fillets can be easily machined using the fillet machining. You can see the automation that has gone into it. In the same way, I can run the splitter fillet finishing. Done. Let's run this also on the machine simulation and look how it looks like. You can see it's a pretty tight region in this case, and you can see how SolidCam is handling it. I'll just stop the tool when it's out there, here, and you can see that it has taken care, okay? It has taken care because I've defined this region here as my collision check uh, region. So it has taken care not to touch that area at all. So it does it pretty neatly. In fact, this is a much easier component than the kind of paths that we have done. We have done even large impellers where the space between the two blades was so small that even my finger would not go and touch the entire surface below. It was that tight. Even in such cases, it has handled the uh, areas very smoothly, very nicely in the solid cam. Right, so once the fillet is done, we can now go, go and machine the hub straight away. In the hub finishing, I again need to provide two main blades and one splitter and of course the hub surface. You can see that I've just taken a small piece of hub surface. It doesn't even get inside here. 
But what is needed by solid cam is just the piece so that you can uh, generate the surface of revolution. Calculate this tool path. Okay, it's done. And this is how the hub finishing looks like. Okay, so it's machining pretty neatly the entire region. So the impeller is a uh, multi-blade machining is a very interesting strategy. You can use this for machining simple impellers, whether it has splitter or not, or you could use it to uh, machine such complex impellers, which has a splitter. It can have two splitters or even three splitters. You can also use multi-blade machining for machining blisks, okay? It makes the blisk machining very, very easy, okay? You don't spend, it's like, Somebody gives you a part and you're off with the tool path in the next half an hour. You'll have the tool path ready and you're ready to machine because these tool paths are all safe tool paths. They're already checked for collision by solid cam. Right, so let's move ahead. Uh, we've done our multi-blade uh, demo and let's go into another interesting region and that's the port machining or tube machining. It's a very powerful uh, function for machining engine ports. You can do engine ports or you can do tube shaped uh, components. Again, like multi-blade, the amount of inputs needed is bare minimum, no tool axis, nothing of that sort, no complex uh, inputs. The tool axis is completely handled automatically by solid cam. And we have separate strategies for roughing, rest roughing, spiral finishing and plunge finishing. Plunge finishing is needed for engines because they would like to have the scallops uh, along the flow of the gases. So that's why the plunge finishing strategy is also being given. And the output can be generated both in four and five axis. So you can have four axis uh, tube machining or five axis tube machining. Let's look at a nice part, simple part, but gives us a pretty much a good idea about what the port machining uh, is capable of doing. So I'm going to take this part. I'll take a slice of this so that you can see how the internal geometry looks like. Okay. So this is how my inside geometry looks like. So I have got a tube and I have made it a little more complex by adding up another feature in between, okay? It's just not a simple tube that is bent. We also have another feature in this case. So if I again go back here uh, to my slice, you can see that I have a feature here. And this feature I have deliberately put in to make the things more complex and see how the port machining can handle it. So in port machining, if I edit the tool path, again here I've got roughing, rest roughing, spiral finishing and plunge finishing uh, tool paths. We'll start off with roughing. Geometry, if you look at the machining surfaces that were selected, all these surfaces were selected as part of my machining surface. Okay. Edit this tool path. I would like to keep one millimeter offset. The tool here I'm using is a lollipop tool. Okay, a levels again is automatic. It's completely defined automatically here. Toolpath parameters, I need to define the cut tolerance, the step over, and the depth of cut. In the sorting, however, is something that is slightly different because in a, in a tube, you can have openings from both the sides, okay? So when, when such a geometry comes in, solid cam can machine the tube from one side all the way down to the center or even more, then it will, it, it will retract and go to the other side and the remaining areas it will try and machine from the other side. So here it is asking me what you would like to do. Do you want to machine both from both the sides or do you want to machine only the top side or only the bottom side? And if it is both, then how much do you want to go from the top side? So the amount that I've said is maximum from the top and whatever remains can be machined from the bottom side. How does it identify top or bottom? In this case, whichever is nearer or to the Z-axis opening, 
will be treated as top. Anything that is away from Z axis will be treated as bottom. Uh, that's it. And uh, in tool axis, you can see that the output axis is five. There's nothing else, no complex tool axis definitions. All I need is to just hit the calculate button. Okay, you can see what it has done now. It's taken into account even this geometry that was given here. It's machining, and if I run the simulation of this, of course, not uh, machine simulation, but simple uh, postcat simulation, it treats first the geometry with a three axis toolpath and slowly tilts it first. And for each pass, it just keeps tilting. So as far as possible, it keeps the tilt constant as if it's doing a three plus two machining. But a time comes where at beyond that a certain point, it can't do three axis or three plus two. And that is when it'll start doing simultaneous five axis machining. But as far as possible, it tries to treat it as three or three plus two. And whatever is not possible is then done with whole five x with any slice that cannot be done using three plus two or three can get treated with full five axis. And then when it can't go any further, it'll retract out from the tube and then machine the other side from, from the other side basically, and go all the way uh, up to the point where the previous area was left out, or it will even overlap into the uh, top area. So you can give any kind of complexity to port machine. You can have anything here. You can have more than one such profile. Even those profiles will be taken care of. Right, so what remains now is simply the finishing and we can do the spiral finishing in this case. Geometry, everything is rem remaining the same. We can just calculate and it will generate a spiral toolpath. By the way, this can also be done using generic machining, but the uh, amount of definitions and the amount of time that the user will spend to generate this toolpath would probably be anywhere between three to four hours to get the same kind of a toolpath. Where I hear I'm spending like a few minutes to generate both the roughing and finishing toolpath. You can see how it has uh, done the machining of the entire part, spiral, and you can also look at the retract the way it is retracting out of the tube, done automatically by solid cam. Anything, uh, it's it's going all the way from top to more than beyond the center up till here. Beyond this, it is not possible, so it retracts out, and the remaining area it machines from the bottom side. Again, by giving a certain amount of overlap into the earlier passes. So. Any tube component, any engine component, the shape doesn't matter because I'll show you the shapes also. The shape here doesn't matter. It need not be round. It can be any shape. You can perform the machining using the port machining engine, provided it, it has got a shape that resembles a tube or like a tunnel, and only then it can be done. You can't use port machining and try to machine a blisk. It will not work. Okay, let's move ahead. Like I said, you can see uh, in the uh, port machining, the geometry need not be uh, round or it need not be cylindrical. You can even have such paths. You have got cylindrical geometry on the top side, but on the bottom side, it's basically a rectangle. So it's morphing between them. You can even machine such paths using port machining. Right, uh, let's go to rotary, which is a very powerful function for machining 
any part that rotates around the fourth axis. Now here, I have th the difference between rotary machining and rotary finishing is that in rotary machining, it's a pure roughing and finishing tool path that it will generate, not just finishing along and across, but it identifies wall features and floor features separately and machines them accordingly. So the classic application for um, rotary machining can be extruder screws or any kind of screws that are even lengthier ones, like one meter, two meter screws, or any part that rotates around the fourth axis and you would like to do roughing and finishing of that part is a very good candidate for rotary machining. We support bull nose, ball nose, and end mills. Okay, these standard tools are supported. The roughing works like simple three axis roughing, but the slicing is done in cylindrical space instead of regular planes. User has to only select the part and the stock, and in one click, it will generate the roughing operation. So let's look at a part on how the rotary machining works. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. It was right in front of me. I'll just suspend the toolpath or delete this toolpath so that we can run the calculation. Mm, I'm just I'm going to say 0 0.9, just save it. Okay, so in rotary machining, all I need to define is, I have to define what my part is. So I can just select this entire solid as one part. You can select one solid or group of surfaces, or it could be a combination of solid and surfaces. So you can even have a hybrid model as your target. And we use the pattern as an offset uh, kind of a pattern. That's generally a, a pocketing kind of a strategy. The tool I'm using here is a 16 corner radius uh, two bull nose uh, levels. You can see everything is automatic. There's nothing there. Only thing I need to define is what is my entry safety distance and the exit safety distance. In the tool path parameters, I need to define what is my step down, my step over, my tolerance for machining. And in the sorting, I can define whether I want zigzag one way machine by regions or levels. It's exactly the same three axis roughing toolpath. Okay, it's simple three axis roughing toolpath, except for the fact that we have given some corner rounding functions in four, five, four axis also. The output here is four axis. Tool axis, you can see that the output is four in four axis. It'll only ask me which is your fourth axis and around which point is my fourth axis rotating. Apart from this, I don't need to provide anything to SolidCam. Everything is by default. Let's hit the calculate button. You can see that the part is now being sliced, but not in planar, but using a cylindrical slicing. So it's generating cylind uh, cylindrical slices of the part. Done. That's straight roughing. It did not take much time for me. So if I run the simulation, uh, let's go to solid verify, of course. Okay, that's my starting stock. And we can run the simulation. So it exactly mimics a three axis roughing cycle. And uh, of course, the axis definition is the uh, fourth, it comes in four axis. But I have a problem here. And the problem here is that if I go in this direction and look at, uh, yeah, this direction, you can see that the tool is exactly cutting on the center. This is not a great uh, situation for 
uh, machining on in fourth axis because the center has really no cutting and in majority of the cases no rpm also so it's not a great way of cutting keeping the tool in the center especially a bull nose tool so in in rotary machining we also have an option to shift the center of the tool by a certain amount so that instead of using the exact tip or the center we move the tool away in let's say in this case y axis and we use the side of the tool to machine so i have in the geometry an option to shift and i can shift it by five millimeters let's calculate this tool path so in in our case it'll move it it'll move the tool in y-axis five millimeters and it will then machine so that i can use the side of the tool the bull nose the actual cutting edges and machine the part it's more efficient that way Of course, you can see that the calculation did not happen as fast as it happened with the center of the cutting. Because center cutting is very easy. Uh, when you shift the tool on the side, that's when the complexity comes up. Yet, I don't spend time in defining any objects or any geometries and trying to uh, force the tool to do something else. I just define a value and hit the calculate button. It's almost like doing simple three axis roughing. right it's done now if i run the simulation here let's go to the machine simulation instead of uh, because there it will be much more clear when the tool shifts okay so um, let's go into the machine housing i would like to see the machine housing and i would like to look from the side you can see that the tool is now currently standing not exactly at the center this is the center line it's not standing in the center line but it is shifted so it's going to move or it's going to cut not with the center but it is going to cut off center since i'm using bi-directional cutting it's going to jump from y plus to y minus when it is cutting because it needs to keep the same point of contact So you can see it's always off center it's never cutting on the center a very efficient way of cutting uh, with a bullnose tool right so uh, <clears throat> that's about rotary you can you can uh, machine any parts resembling either this or even anything that rotates around fourth axis you would like to do the roughing you can use a rotary machining to do the roughing. Okay, let's move ahead. And let's come to another very interesting uh, area of our uh, session today. I think this is the second last uh, module that I'm going to show you, and that's the edge breaking module. Edge breaking looks very simple, and the operation also sounds very simple, but trust me, the amount of uh, time and the amount of uh, work that is involved after a part has been cut to blunt out the entire edges is very high. I have few customers of mine who are into aerospace and they employ 30 to 40 people only to do edge breaking once the component comes out of the machine, okay? Because how are they going to do the edge breaking on the machine itself? There are so many edges on that. And when you would like to program this, such a part, the amount of time it takes to program a part for edge breaking is equal to the amount of time uh, the user spends programming the part for cutting itself. So generally the users don't like to do edge breaking. They only pick up certain edges that are very important and do that. The rest of the edges, they leave it to the manual labor who then will use the special tools for doing uh, the debarring 
and they'll do it now it will depend on the mood of the user because these are not very skilled people they are contract laborers or their laborers and then they uh, sometimes use more force sometimes they use less force so sometimes you will see a big chamfer sometimes you will not see the chamfer at all it might have come proper so rejections are also very high when you are doing edge breaking manually especially if it's a critical component uh, the edge breaking functionality in solid cam generates edge breaking toolpath automatically and creates a debarring toolpath so you can do the edge breaking in three axis so if you have a part that has just been machined using three axis then you can do the edge breaking using the three axis functionality of edge breaking cycle or you could do edge breaking using minimum tilting or almost like a three plus two or full five axis so you can machine the most complex parts or edge break the most complex parts using five axis like i said this currently this is a manual process even programming is a manual programming and can approximately take the same time as that being spent to fully program the part in a CAM system. So most of the times this is just ignored, only critical edges are taken and there uh, the edge breaking is done of that rest, everything is left to manual edge breaking. Uh, currently, we are supporting uh, ball nose tools only for edge breaking because it's just to remove that fine edge. So naturally you're going to get a very small radius but that radius is actually invisible to naked eye uh, in the version that will follow in 2022 of solid cam we will uh, we'll have uh, two uh, two new kinds of uh, edge breaking happening first of all we will we will allow uh, flattened mills and chamfer tools to be used for edge breaking in uh, even in five axis Secondly, we will allow users to not generate a chamfer, but to generate a small fillet along the entire edges using ball nose tools. Even if the fillet is not present in the geometry, you can, with edge breaking, generate even the fillets on the, on the edges using ball nose tools. When I'm talking of fillets, not, I'm not talking about the female, this kind of fillets, the depressions. I'm talking about the projected kind of fillets or uh i'm if this was the edge i'm not talking about this fillet i'm actually going to talk about this fillets this fillet is what will be possible in 2022 version of solid cam right so let's look at a part uh i'm going to open a part which is slightly controversial uh i'll tell you once you look at the part you'll see why it is controversial Okay, so I have this part. Few of my customers or even my own people ask me, first of all, how are you going to manufacture this part that you're showing us that you would like to do edge breaking? This part cannot be done, manufactured. I will say this part can be manufactured. And how is this manufactured? This is manufactured using a simple casting process. The gravitational casting process can easily produce this part without any issues. And once this casting is produced, there are several areas that need machining. For example, this face needs machining, this face needs machining, this face needs machining, because these are functional faces. This bore needs machining, this face here needs machining, this face needs machining, the outer face needs machining, this inner face needs machining, and maybe even this face needs machining. Or even if they don't, we need the outer machining and the inner machining. When all this machining has been done, it's going to create burrs or it's going to create sharp uh, uh, edges around this and we need to deburr this. And that's why we need to do edge breaking. Edge breaking is a very powerful but a very simple and easy cycle. For example, if I edit the edge breaking cycle, so in the geometry, I have to define what my target is. So I can just pick my solid as it is. Perfect, this is done. The edges are automatically detected, okay? 
you can either do an automatic detection or if it's a very complex edge but uh, or you would like to do only a certain portion of the part then you can manually select those edges okay otherwise if you would like to do the entire part you can just say auto detect all the edges and the edge detection angle is that what is this 15 degrees this 15 degrees is the angle that is formed by this face and this face and currently this is 90 degrees so automatically this will be found but if the edge if the angle between this face and this face is less than 15 degrees then that particular edge will be ignored automatically sometimes it could be a functional edge you don't want it to be chopped off okay so you can specify what is that angle beyond which only the edges will be detected below that edges will not be detected the tool in this case i'm using a ball nose tool levels you can see everything is grayed out which means it is automatic toolpath parameters tolerance for calculation and it's asking me what is the width of the champ or edge that you would like to create so i'm i've just specified 0 0.2 millimeters of width that i need to blunt out so we'll see a very fine chamfer like thing if you analyze it very very deeply under microscope you will see a radius but otherwise it just looks like a chamfer uh, direction is climb and in the tool axis i have got uh, three axis four axis four plus one five axis minimum tilting and full five x so we are going to look at the three axis tool path linking you can see again everything is automatic it only says link to the clearance area retract to the clearance area that's it so i'm going to save this tool path and i'll calculate the tool path done so it has found all the edges where it could possibly do edge breaking with a simple three axis cycle so if i run the simulation now in uh, solid verify this is my stock okay so this is my machined part and let's run Okay, you can see that it takes into account even the holder. So it doesn't machine all the way down. It makes sure that the holder doesn't touch. It cuts all the areas that are possible with a three axis toolpath. That's it. So it has taken into account all the edges that can be possibly done with three axis. And you can see a very fine chamfer like to a cut that has been done along the edges that is equal to 0 0.2 millimeters on all these parts on all the areas of course there are several other areas but that they cannot be approached using a three axis tool path for example it it could not it has not gone all the way down here all the way down here it is just stopped here and that is the reason because uh, there is also a fixture the vice is holding the uh, part, so that part was defined, and that is the reason why it did not. Let's jump to the full five axis. So I'm going to suppress the two operations here. The same tool path I've just copied, and what I've done here is instead of the three axis as my tool axis, I have said five axis. And I've defined my tilt range. I don't want it to go to 90 degrees. I don't want it to tilt 90 degrees. So I've defined a tilt range between zero and 75 degrees. That's all. I don't need to do anything else. I can just simply calculate the tool path. Remember, this is a very complex calculation, but it is making it look very, very easy because I did not define any tilt geometry, no collision check geometry, nothing. I just said, this is my part, 
find the edges, find your own tool axis, and give me the tool path. So we have a strange looking toolpath, but don't worry, this is not how the toolpath is going to look. If I run the simulation, you will see how it beautifully does the uh, edge breaking of all the possible edges now. I've removed the fixture so that I wanted to cut everywhere. Wherever possible, simple three axis. Where it is not possible for it to do three axis, it will tilt. There, it tilts machines. Tilts, tilts on this side and cuts. Again, it's tilted on this side, cut. Top again, three axis, tilt, cut from the inner side, go from this side. So it can, it can approach from this side, so that's how it's doing. Again, three axis. Now for the outer one, machining the side edges. Machining this one. Machining that side. Now it's machining the inside of the area. You can see how, how smoothly it is done. Taken care of all the regions not to have any kind of collisions and wherever it is possible for it, it has given me the edge breaking, okay? So it's so neatly done the toolpath. Like I said, it might look simple, but trust me, the calculation is very, very, very complex. If I had to do this manually using different geometries, the amount of construction that I would need to do to generate even a simple toolpath for this region here, this just these four edges, would be tremendous. The amount of construction that I need to do to make the tool go in a certain way, cut it, then retract, then go to the other side, define so many different geometries I had to define to make the tool path. Here, I just said, take the part, that's the tool, I want 0.2 millimeters cut everywhere. That's it, the tool path was generated. I don't have to specify anything else. It's that automated. Now imagine this particular part you're producing in thousands and you have employed people who are doing going to do uh, edge breaking. Now, if the part is not a critical part, manual edge breaking works. But if it's a critical part and if it's an aerospace part and it's a critical part and it has been specified very clearly that you have to have this small edge breaking, not more than this. In that case, edge breaking has to be done on the machine itself and not manually. And once that edge breaking process seems to happen on the machine, it's it's as good as programming the entire part again. If you have taken eight hours to make all the programs, you're going to take another six to seven hours only to create the edge breaking programs manually. So this completely removes out that. It can automatically create the entire edge breaking programs within a matter of 40 to 50 seconds on, on such a part. Of course, if the part is large, it might take one or two minutes, but again, the process is totally automated. Okay, uh, let's move to the last part of our uh, uh, masterclass, and that is basically the last uh, module that we introduced again in 2021, and that is edge trimming. So we have this energy efficient materials in aerospace, the composites, they're getting popular and they're generally cast, and these parts require an edge trimming to uh, get to their final shape. In automotive, you have got vacuum form parts, or even in consumer durables, you have vacuum form parts, and once the vacuum forming is done, you need to cut those parts to their final shape. To do this, we have got the edge trimming uh, toolpath, which is a highly automated algorithm to create 
edge trimming toolpath. It's almost no, um, there are absolutely no inputs, okay, except for selecting the part. There's no other input that is needed. The trimming edge can be defined automatically, like the edge breaking. It can be found or defined automatically, or you can user define it. And the position of the tool is relative to the geometry. It can be defined either as a three axis edge breaking toolpath or a five axis edge breaking toolpath with different tool axis orientations. So let's look at one part and see what is possible with edge breaking. <clears throat> um, sorry, edge trimming. So I have a part that's put on the fixture. In fact, I've made the toolpath, so I'm going to uh, remove the toolpath. <clears throat> okay, let me just change something in this, maybe angle step so that I just delete the toolpath. So in edge trimming, you can define what is your part upper surface. So in this case, all the pink surfaces have been selected as my part upper surface. The edge or the drive curves is set to auto detect. You can define manually also if you want certain edges on the to be done. And in the uh, tool path or in the tool, you can use any kind of tool, whether it is bull nose, ball nose, flattened mill, anything. In this case, we have used a, a 10 diameter flattened mill. Levels, it's set to plane. Toolpath parameters, again, you can see the passes, basically the tolerance and the start point. In this case, I'm not going to use automatic, but I'm going to define, or I want to like to start the toolpath maybe from some point here. Let's see where, from where it starts. Tool axis control, so you have got three axis uh, mode, you have got four plus one, and you have five axis. So I'm using the five axis and I've said, tool axis to be normal to the top surface. But I have also said my tilt should not exceed or it should not tilt beyond 45 degrees. It should go only in the range between zero and 45. Because in some cases, if I want it to be normal, for example, here in this case, it will go much beyond that and we might have a collision with the holder here on these surfaces. So that's the reason I have kept the tilt range between zero and 45. All right, that's all that is needed. Let's calculate the toolpath. Done. You can see that I wanted it to start at this point, and this is exactly where it has started. It has identified all the edges where it needs to be trimmed, and those edges are trimmed off. So if I, <coughs> sorry, run the simulation of my host CAD. Let's reduce the speed. You can see that it's going normal to the surface, but it will always respect that limit that I've set and machine the side. So it's actually cutting the side. It's opening up the uh, side. So anything excess is being removed off. Again, when it comes here, you can see that 45 degrees, that's it it will not exceed that 45 degrees. You can also specify the tilt using lines, okay? If you want certain specific areas to be tilted in a specific way, you can define using orientation lines. Otherwise, you can just leave it with the angle and you can control the limits. Again, within 45, cuts open. And you can see what is happening here is that I've pushed the tool inside the material. So it's going five millimeter below the thickness of the material. And that's how it will open up and cut out the excess part. Classic example in this case is a vacuum formed component. Okay, so very simple application, but extremely powerful toolpath generation capabilities. If you're doing vacuum forming, if you're doing composite parts trimming, then you can use edge trimming to machine uh, parts like these. 
Right, so we have come to our end of our masterclass. Uh, somebody asked me a question here, so let me also answer. Uh, can it machine the internal uh, edges first and then the external? Uh, currently, no, there is no such way. The only way he is here is to define the edges manually so that it follows the, uh, the uh, priority. So if you define your internal edges first, it will do the internal edges first and then go to the external edges. But if you leave it to, to the automatic, then it will always go to the uh, outer edge first and then do the inner edge, okay? So you can, you can if you want, manually control it by uh, defining the uh, priority. You can say manually, I have defined the edge, this edge first, this edge second, this edge third, and then finally the outer edge. It will do that. It will follow that. Right. So uh, let's uh, summarize. So what we have seen till now of all our uh, modules is that SolidCam has a complete solution to machine any part in four and five axis. I have not seen any part that cannot be done with SolidCam. We can do almost any given part, at least till today with our existing four and five axis solution that includes of course the application based machining strategies it's a it's been developed from a very very long time so it's really tested and proven simultaneous four and five axis engine it's pretty easy to learn and it has an intuitive gui uh, unlike our competitors where the gui changes with the process in solid cam the gui remains more or less constant the uh, the definitions which you see on the side, like geometry, coordinate system, tool, tool path parameters, tool axis, all of those remain constant irrespective of whether you are in generic five axis machining or impeller machining or port machining or swarf machining. The side menu remains more or less the same. So it's pretty intuitive and it can be easily learned. With generic four, uh, four and five axis, you can have complete control over collision avoidance. And in the uh, application-based stra based strategies, the collision avoidance is automated. So we have got application-specific strategies for machining impellers, ports, rotary components, aero structures, and die mold paths. That's when I say die mold, I'm basically uh, talking here about the tilting. And then finally, in 2021, when we introduced edge debring and trimming, they added value to our entire offering of five axis. So I believe uh, we have completely covered the entire uh, uh, module structure of SolidCam's five axis. In event, if you have any questions, you can always write to us on our email. I'll be more than glad to answer your emails. For my resellers and my staff who have been working with me, I'm available on Skype. You can get in touch with me on Skype, but for uh, customers or prospects who are looking to evaluate uh, Solid Camps 5 Axis, please get in touch with us on our email address. Uh, we also have training, online training that we offer according to the Indian Standard Time for people who would like to evaluate the simultaneous 5 Axis uh, module of Solid Cam. We also will offer that along with the evaluation license. Right. So. I think we have covered uh, the entire uh, process. Uh, next week, we are going to have a very interesting webinar. You'll all get the uh, uh, invitation soon. Uh, till then, uh, thank you very much for uh, attending all of these series. This series is completely recorded. It will be sent to you as a YouTube link. You can also go to our website, and this link will be available under our recorded webinars. So you can have a look also on our website. Thank you very much for attending this sessions, all the three sessions. Take care. Bye-bye.